Hail, horrors. Hail, infernal world. And thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor. One who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. Yes, gentle listener, I am drawing inspiration this week from the words of Satan himself. As expressed by the poet John Milton in his epic masterpiece, Paradise Lost. And the words came to me just a couple weeks ago as I lay prone on my side, having thrown my back out on day three of a tropical vacation in Curacao. And as I lay there, my own Paradise Lost, I thought, how. Like Lucifer, can I make a heaven of this hell? And how can all of us make heavens of the hells in which we find ourselves? And I'll tell you all about it on the other side. You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah. Paradise Lost is... big. (laughs) Paradise Lost is one of the great literary masterpieces of all time, okay? It is a literary Sistine Chapel. It is a literary... Grand Theft Auto V, in terms of its scope, its depth, its hugeness, and the work and the time and the effort and the genius that went into it, okay? Paradise Lost is one of the great pieces of art that has ever been produced. But it's big, all right? The thing is a freaking brick. The thing is a doorstop. There is an edition of Paradise Lost available on Amazon right now. That's over 500 pages. (laughs) Now, that is not all poem, all right? That is not all poem. That will be introductions. That will be scholarship. That will be notes. But the point is, this thing is a freaking brick, okay? And what it is, is the story of Lucifer's rebellion in heaven, right? From the Bible. Lucifer's rebellion against God and he and his army of fallen angels being cast out of heaven and into hell. And then his decision to take revenge upon God by entering earth and corrupting humanity. Garden of Eden, all that stuff, okay? It is an epic poem. It's a poem. It's an epic poem about that famous biblical story, okay? An incredibly astonishingly ambitious piece of work published in the late 1600s, all right? And what's mind-blowing about it is that Milton dictated the whole freaking thing, (laughs) right? He was already an accomplished and celebrated poet, a very famous figure by this point in his life when he got to writing what became Paradise Lost, but he was blind. He had lost his sight many years before. He was getting older. And so he dictated this freaking thing without being able easily to go back and see what was on the previous page or 50 pages ago. He had to dictate all of this. And what's more, he wrote the whole thing in blank verse. And you say to yourself, what the hell is blank verse? (laughs) Well, blank verse is basically unrhymed iambic pentameter. And you say to yourself, what the hell is iambic pentameter? (laughs) Iambic pentameter is, if you will, a poetic schema, 
doing a callback to a previous episode. Iambic pentameter is a poetic schema built around lines of 10 syllables, okay? So in iambic pentameter, every line has 10 syllables, and those 10 syllables are subdivided into two syllable sets that are called feet. So every line of iambic pentameter has five two syllable feet. What makes it iambic is the meter or the rhythm of those feet. So every one of them, it's two syllables and they work like this. There is a short syllable and a long syllable, or if you like, a soft syllable and an accented syllable. Sounds like this, da da, da da, da da, da da, da da. That's five feet, five sets of two syllables equaling 10, and that is a line of iambic pentameter. And when I say this, when I do this, Da 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 da. All of my fellow drummers out there perk up and they recognize immediately that that's a shuffle. It is a literary blues shuffle. Da 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 Right? And you've encountered iambic pentameter along the way because you read Shakespeare. Or, at least you told your teacher that you read Shakespeare. And then on exam day, it became clear that you did not, in fact, read Shakespeare. (laughs) But some of it leaked in, okay, because Shakespeare made great use of iambic pentameter in a lot of his plays. It appears all over his plays, and in particular in his poems, in his sonnets, all right? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. And you say to yourself, "Uh, dude, I'm hearing you read that, and I'm not getting any jive out of it. (laughs) I'm not getting LaGrange here. Where is the blue shuffle? Well, listen again. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. It is a blue shuffle, all right? You speed that up, you put it on your feet. Shakespeare wrote hot for teacher. (laughs) And so that is iambic pentameter, all right? That's your literary lesson for the day. Blank verse is that pattern without the rhyming scheme, all right? So blank verse, iambic pentameter with no rhymes. And so here we have John Milton, who is dictating this whole thing without really being able to refer back to stuff. And he's doing the whole dang thing in blank verse as he goes. And he can't see it. (laughs) I could see it. All right, I could see it. Because it was assigned to me as part of whatever course I was taking when I was doing my English degree. And so this was assigned to me. And that feels, in retrospect, psychotic. Doing any sort of a degree in the arts or humanities is psychotic, all right? I'm doing an English degree, right? My Shakespeare courses were one play a week. So every week you're on the hook for a new Shakespeare. Remember in high school when you did Romeo and Juliet or you did Macbeth or you did Hamlet? And it was like a semester. It was a term. It was like three and a half months. No, one a week. Bang him out, bang him out, bang him out. But you've also got a novel course. And so you're on the hook for a novel as well that week and a hundred pages each in a couple of history courses. And then there's five papers due and midterms are coming. And why don't we just throw freaking paradise loss on top of that pile, huh? Because you can handle all that, kids. And so paradise lost was assigned to me and I read the bulk of it on a plane ride from Toronto to Paris, okay? My then girlfriend was studying in France for the year, and so I went on my reading week over to visit her. And during that time, 
didn't we get engaged on an empty subway car on the outskirts of Paris? How indie and how romantic is that? Cue the crowd fawning sound effect. That's a long flight, all right? That's like an eight-hour flight. I'm reading Paradise Lost basically the whole time there and back. It is a big-ass poem, man. And I don't remember anything about it. Because <laughs> how could you? Because how could you? A, it's not written in modern English. And so that's tough right off the bat. You remember reading Shakespeare, right? This came 100 years after Shakespeare. But the point remains, part of the problem with Shakespeare is like you read it and you go, uh, what? And then you've got to invest all this energy into what the hell it even means. And what's the story? And why didn't they just show more video? Like, I, uh, this whole notion of having to read Shakespeare out loud in class. And you could barely read modern English, let alone trying to fumble your way through that. Who's, who's getting anything from that? <laughs> I taught Hamlet. As a student teacher, I taught Hamlet to an OAC class. That's for you young kids. We used to have five years of high school. Grade 13 was the OAC year. And people from outside Ontario, I don't know the hell I'm talking about. Anyways, the oldest kids in the high school, the oldest academic kids, I taught Hamlet. And we used Mel Gibson. Because why on earth would you listen to me trying to tell you when you could just watch the freaking thing and try to figure out what the hell's going on? This is a pedagogy thing, and I don't know what they do now. It's been 25 years since I was anywhere near a classroom, and long may that continue. Hard to get, hard to retain, all right? Hard to retain what you're reading in some of this stuff. So it was with Milton, and I had so many other freaking things to read and so many other things to do. You can't invest the time in it to really understand it. And so I was forgetting <laughs> the lines of Paradise Lost as soon as I read them. But the one thing I held on to, right, the one thing that remained, and it's among the most famous quotes from the whole poem, is what I read in the introduction. This line... That Satan says, after he and all of his rebellious angels have been kicked out of heaven. And it's a powerful sequence. It's an important sequence in the poem, in the story. Said then the lost archangel, this is the seat that we must change for heaven? This mournful gloom for that celestial light? Be it so. Since he who is now sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right. Fardest from him is literally Fardest, F-A-R-D-E-S-T. From him is best whom reason hath equaled force, hath made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors. Hail, infernal world. And thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor. There's a new sheriff in town, kids. One who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I still be the same and what I should be all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater? Here at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here this place for his envy will not drive us hence here, we may reign secure. And in my choice, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. But wherefore let we then, our faithful friends, the associates and co-partners of our loss, lie thus astonished on the oblivious pool? and call them not to share with us their part in this unhappy mansion, or once more with rallied arms to try what may be yet regained in heaven, or what more lost in hell. Let us, this is me now, let us make a heaven of hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. This, this is a politician, my friends. This is Winston Churchill <laughs> for the underworld. <laughs> Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Let us make a heaven of hell. Let us make 
a heaven of hell. And that has stayed with me as one of my isms all along the way. Now, throughout the course of this podcast, I have delivered some of those things that I hold on to, those anchoring phrases that I pull out when circumstances demand. I talked about, stand in there, Johnny. My boy, Clugger, behind the screen at the baseball diamond, encouraging me to get in on the plate as a batter and take my cut. And I have used that as motivation even when I was teaching, walking up to teach Hamlet to those kids. Stand in there, Johnny. I talked about that one. I talked about what's the truth. You know, what's the story and what's the truth? You are confronted with a situation where you feel bad about yourself and something's going on that you're taking personally. And you stop and you say, well, what's the story here? What's the story I'm telling myself? And what's the actual truth? Because a lot of times they are not the same thing. I talked about here we are. This phrase I use when we come upon a circumstance that cannot be changed. When we are lost in our lament, when we are focused on the past and not moving forward, we stop and we say, okay, all that happened and here we are. Where do we go from here? Well, one of the others that I use is make a heaven of hell. And it came to me couple weeks ago, last week, when I was in Curacao, in paradise, on the island, man. And I slept on a soft bed, and the next day I sneezed. I was going to call this episode Soft Bed and a Sneeze. (laughs) And didn't my back go out? Wham! Just like that. That's all it takes for me, man. Soft bed and a sneeze. My back goes out, and it's like I'm three days in. I'm here on a two-week vacation. Three days in, my back is crocked, and suddenly I'm finding myself on the back porch, on my side, with a pillow between my knees, watching iguanas sneaking up the stairs at me, and that's a version of hell. All right, there are layers. There's a Dante's Inferno. There's different circles, but that's a version of hell. All right, you are in paradise, and for me, it was, in a certain sense, a paradise lost because I couldn't do anything. The people we were with are going off snorkeling and going off to the beach, doing whatever. Here I am on my side with a pillow between my knees, mobile, but being careful not to make it worse because the next step is I'm not mobile anymore. Then we've really got ourselves a problem, right? And so the temptation is to pull up your lamentations and be mad at the world and to be bitter and to complain. And you get into this negative mindset about it, like, woe is me, why is this happening? What the hell, man? And that becomes toxic and that drags you down and that's an energy that pulls in and you just make yourself even more miserable than you already are. Well, in those circumstances, ever since Milton, I think to myself, let us make a heaven of hell. Let us look at this circumstance we're in, which is not ideal, it's a freaking hell. How do we make a heaven of it? And I've used this as a much more constructive way to deal with and encounter kind of rough circumstances. One of the examples that comes to mind is the first tour I did in Europe with Sarah Smith, 2017. We went over in November, and about three days after we touched the ground, a virus just ripped through the tour van that hit like a freaking truck, man. So intense and so prevalent was the virus that when I wrote the tour blog about that tour, which eventually turned into the November book, one of the characters is the virus of the van, okay? It is this specter that just freaking haunted us, and it knocked us on our collective asses, man, one at a time. Sarah lost her voice. We had to cancel a couple of shows, and it was... Just It's one of those viruses that is just devastating. You're exhausted. You lose your voice. You just feel like crap. It's just bad. It was was COVID before COVID. We all got it, all right? And what do you do with that? And I can remember the moment where we hit peak virus of the van. Katie and Josh, I hope you're paying attention. We hit peak virus of the van. 
We were in Berlin, okay? We had gone there. We were set to do a show, maybe two in Berlin, and we couldn't do it. Sarah could not sing. Sarah could barely stand up, let alone sing. Voice was completely gone, and we had to cancel them. But we had received, as a gift from our friends, the Doll Brothers, sweet guys, they were the entertainment directors for a really nice hotel in Berlin, and they had arranged for us to be able to stay there, which is a really great bonus. And so there was a moment in time, the show was off, Sarah was in bed, you know, we didn't even see her for a couple of days. And I was billeted. I was staying with Denny Boy. And I'm just laying on the bed looking around. And Denny has his helix out, his guitar set up. And he's just, you know, quietly arranging some tones and working on some stuff. And it occurred to me, those lines again make a heaven of hell. We were in a kind of tour hell. I mean, we were canceling shows. Not what you want to do, especially when you need the money to cover your freaking overheads. And you're supposed to be there to play for audiences. Canceling shows is the worst thing. And we're all sick. And that's a hell. You know, on the road, that is a hell. But we were making a heaven of it to the degree that we could. Danny was working on his tones. I was recovering and I was writing the blog and I was trying the best that I could to bring the silver lining in, all right, to bring the positive side in. Sarah was making a heaven of it by simply sleeping it off. You know, we were in a really nice hotel in one of the great cities of the world. We were comfortable. We were warm. We were looked after, all right? We had people who were there for us. And this is making a heaven of hell. And I had to do that laying on my side in Curacao too. So I'm there, I'm by myself, I'm fighting off iguanas to the degree that I can. And I had to stop at a certain point and say, okay, if I'm not careful, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole here. I'm going to get depressed. I'm going to get upset. I'm going to get frightened. I'm going to go into these chronic back problems that I have that haven't bothered me for a year, by the way. And why are they back now? And how unfair is this? And I had to stop and I had to say, okay, how do we make a heaven of hell here? Well, the first thing we do is we look with a certain sense of gratitude about the good things. All right. What is the silver lining in this circumstance? Well, I'm in Curacao. <laughs> it's 30 degrees outside. There's a pool right there. And with effort, I can get to it. I don't have any gigs that I have to cancel, all right? I don't have obligations that I need to get to. One of the things we thought when we were sick with the virus in 2017 was, if you got to be sick, a nice hotel in Berlin is not a bad place to be sick, man. <laughs> so it is. If your back is going to be out, then a warm, relatively comfortable couch outside in Curacao is not a bad place for your back to be out. And I had people there who were keeping an eye on me, looking after me. And it wasn't as bad as it might have been. And I knew that with a little bit of care and a little bit of work, I could probably pull myself out of this physically again. And so the first thing in making a heaven of hell is simply to look around and say, what do we got? All right, what do we got that's positive? What can we work with here? That was Satan. All right, Satan is in hell. And he's looking around and he's like, this sucks, especially compared to that celestial light from which we've been thrown. But at least here we're free. All right. At least here we are not subject to that God up there. And you can have your own opinions on that. Milton was a Republican. All right. Do not confuse that with Donald Trump. Donald Trump is, in a certain way, the opposite of what a traditional Republican was in England. A Republican in England in the 1600s was a person who was not into the monarchy. A Republican was somebody who wanted the English government to be a republic. And he was outspoken about not liking the monarchy as a system of government. And it made him unpopular in certain circles, by the way. And so you can read into Paradise Lost kind of a commentary on this authoritarian dictatorship style government. 
Satan's looking around. Lucifer is looking around saying, I don't like being subject here. I don't like the authoritarian rule of heaven. So at least down here, it sucks, but we're in charge, right? Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. So he's looking at that as a positive, all right? And he says, God didn't make this place because he wanted to be here. (laughs) So he's not coming to kick us out of here. You know, he doesn't want this place. Donald Trump, by the way, to finish that, seems to be wanting to establish a monarchy in the United States. <laughs> He's the opposite of a 1600s English Republican who wanted a democratic Republican government. No, Trump seems to want a dictatorship, which is what Republicans were against. But what do I know? I'm just a caveman. So Satan's looking around and he's saying, at least here we're free. All right, we got that going for us and we can do as we please and we are no longer subject to what he sees as an authoritarian government upstairs. That's what we had to do in Berlin. It's like, okay, we're sick. This sucks. We're canceling shows. This really sucks. But we're in Berlin and what an opportunity that is. And those of us who were able to stand took advantage You know, and had a day off to go look around and see parts of Berlin that we probably wouldn't have been able to do had we still had the gigs to play. So we kind of looked at, what do we got? You know, we appreciated what we had in the circumstances. I appreciated in Curacao that I was in Curacao. And it was warm, and I could be outside, and there was sunshine, because we've had precious little of that around here over the winter. And you simply have to look at whatever the silver lining is. And I know there's levels. Again, I understand the difference between being sick on the road and a cancer diagnosis. I get it, all right? It becomes more advanced the more dire the circumstances become. You know, if you are in Ukraine right now, if you are in Gaza right now, not perhaps so easy to take a look around and say, what do we got? And be happy with that. But maybe it is, you know, maybe simply having some food. I think of Survivor Man. (laughs) Almost every morning when I eat a piece of fruit for breakfast, apple or banana, whatever, I think of Survivor Man, Les Stroud. I love the Survivor Man show where Les Stroud would be just dropped off in some remote part of the world and he would film himself surviving for a week. Fascinating stuff. And he would often go days without eating anything. And as I'm eating my banana, I think to myself, how delighted, how excited would Les Stroud be to simply have this banana to eat in the morning, you know? And when you begin to compare what other people don't have, it becomes much more easy to appreciate what you do have. And then, of course, the next evolution is, as Ramdas says, you know, committing yourself to ending suffering in the world. How can we make it so other people have a freaking banana too? I digress. In different circumstances, it becomes more difficult to see what you have and appreciate what you have. But then, you know, also in those dire circumstances, maybe it doesn't take much. I'm trying very hard to be sensitive here because I have had the privilege in my whole freaking life to not live in a war zone (laughs) and to not be attacked and to not have to deal with some of the absolutely brutal stuff that life can throw at you. And so I recognize the privilege in everything I'm saying here, okay? But when circumstances arise that are less than ideal, I do remember the words of Satan. Let's make a heaven of this hell. And so we did in Berlin, and so I tried to do in Curacao. And it's important not to wallow. For me, the wallowing is the dangerous part. You become very existential about this. And so, to the best of your ability, you've got to not wallow in what's going on. Satan could have wallowed. All right, he got thrown into hell, and he thought, this is good. All right, it sucks, but at least we have this, 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 and this. He did not wallow. He began immediately to set himself to the task of making this as good as it could be and appreciating what was good about it. I've had to do that at jobs before. You know, you work in a job and it freaking sucks. Everybody's been in that position. 
And the temptation is just to give up and roll over, but, and you want to quit, you know, and ideally that's the thing to do. Quit and move on. Can't always do that. Circumstances don't always permit it. What can you do to make a heaven of that employment hell? Well, you appreciate your coworkers because every place you will ever work, what makes it good or bad is the people. And so if you've got people in your office people in your workplace who you appreciate, who you value, when you've got a band of people like that, you can endure a lot of really crap circumstances in a job, man. And so you find those people and you indulge in those people. Or you stop and you say, okay, it's hell in this employment, but I'm getting paid. And being paid is what allows me to have these other things that I enjoy my life or to look after my family or to have this house or or, 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 or to go to freaking Curacao. It's like you can, you don't have to endure the circumstances forever, okay? But while you're in them, you can find things like, I really appreciate these people. I really appreciate getting paid. This job is soul destroying. And as I've talked about in the past, you can learn from the things that destroy your soul because they tell you what uplifts your soul, right? I mean, there's always lessons. There's always things to be gleaned. So it is with Satan. So it is with Lucifer looking around saying, all right, we're in charge here now at least. All right, that is something I can grab onto in this nightmarish circumstance. You can indulge your resilience. <laughs> Think about this. Think about this quote from another great masterpiece of the English language. It ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Does that come to mind? That was not Milton. That was not Shakespeare. That was not iambic pentameter. That was Rocky. <laughs> That's Rocky talking to his kid who's turned into a bit of a whiner, getting pushed around by people. It's not about that. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Satan, Lucifer, almost treats the hell thing like that. It's like, what do you got, God? Right? To put me in the worst place in the world, I'm loving it. <laughs> you know? And you can sort of begin to indulge and be proud of your resilience. It's like, how much more can you bring? How much more can you give me? Hit me harder, champ. Hit me harder, champ. Is that all you got? Is that all you got? That's Rocky and Rocky Three, fighting Clubber Lang in the second fight. And just taking all of the punches, taking them all and watching as Clubber just blows himself out, man, it's rope dope. Can you apply that to this circumstance you're in that sucks? Like, okay, how much more can they bring me? All right. Now I understand again, if we're talking about serious illness here, we're talking about serious poverty here. This becomes a much different thing. But if you're in a job you don't like, or you're on the road and it's rough, can you draw some power from your resilience? Can you in that way make a heaven of hell? Can you make it an endurance sport? <laughs> and at the end of it, because all things end, you know, I believe it was Douglas Copeland who said, nothing really, really good and nothing really, really bad ever last really, really long. You know, these things do end. Can you come to the end of it and say, look how resilient I was? Look at the dignity I preserved in those circumstances. <laughs> you know, can you do that? Can you do that? Can you use that to make a heaven of hell? I thought about that lying on my side in Curacao. One of the things was let's preserve what dignity I have here. <laughs> you know, I'm traveling with other people with whom I have not traveled before. One of the things I could have done very easily was be a prima donna about it. I could have sulked about it. I could have whined about it. I could have made it all about me. I could have been a burden to people. I could have whimpered. I could have whined. I could have done all those things. Didn't do that. Why? A, it's undignified. B, I don't want to bring down other people's freaking vacations. When this thing is over, what I would like people to have remembered was that my back was out, but we handled it kept a good attitude about it, kept positive. You know, if you can keep positive spirits, that changes a lot, man. The mindset with which you enter a circumstance 
plays a huge role in how that circumstance unfolds, right? I talked about that with the gig with Kay in the snowstorm recently. What you bring into the circumstance is very, very important. And if the circumstance sucks, if you can walk into that job you hate with a certain smile on your face or even this kind of weird, perverse desire <laughs> for it to get worse just to prove that you can take it, you know, whatever you can grab onto that makes a heaven of this thing that even makes in a weird way a game of it. All of this stuff comes into play and it's all to do with making a heaven of hell. And so I mentioned Josh and Katie because I know that they have their own virus to deal with right now. Sucks. You've got gigs every freaking day. It is very difficult to perform under those circumstances. What can you do to make a heaven of it? You know, what, how can you look at the circumstances and say, well, there's this element of heaven in this hell. And what can we do to make it better? What can we do to make it more fun? What can we make it, what can we do to make it feel better? You know, you're at a job you freaking hate or doing a task that you freaking hate, but can you make a heaven of that hell with music? You know, I once worked in a warehouse for an insurance company and a lot of my job at the time was shredding documents and there'd be boxes, 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 dozens and dozens of boxes just full of documents, old contracts, old paperwork, stuff that needed to be shredded because it was confidential. My job, part of it, was to be the guy on the shredder. And so I'm eight hours standing at a shredder just feeding documents in. And then stuff's getting jammed and I got to unjam it and then there's a pain in the ass. What are we going to do to make a heaven of that hell? Well, I'm going to bring my freaking headphones and I'm going to listen to a lot of music. And music is the bomb for me. I love listening to music. Now I would make it podcasts, whatever. And I'm just going to enjoy listening to that music while I do that thing and I get paid, you know? Can you do that? What can you bring to the circumstance that just makes it better? Can you, you know, I've had other jobs, one in particular where I just didn't like being in that office. The whole office environment didn't work for me. It's like, okay, how do we make a heaven of this hell? Well, I'm going to do a coffee run every day. <laughs> I'm going down every day for a coffee run. Does anybody want a coffee? You know, I became known in different places as the guy you went to when you had a coffee order. It's like, I'll do that. You know, I will bring that into this workplace. I used to do that. I prided myself and it was moronic, but I was a kid. I prided myself on the class clown thing when I was in high school because high school can be a hell, kids. Sitting in some of those classes in high school can be a freaking hell. How can we make a heaven of it? Well, there's that jackass in the corner who makes us laugh every day. And I took that upon myself. Okay, yes, it was an attention-seeking behavior, but I was very conscious, even as a teenager, that what I was bringing in terms of being funny or being silly or being that goofy guy in the class was actually serving people. And I had them tell me that. You know, I had somebody write in my yearbook, thanks so much for making this class more fun. <laughs> Drove some teachers crazy and, you know, they had to make their own heaven of that hell. But it's like, even then I thought I can make a heaven of this hell without even having read Milton yet. The concept was there. I'm going to make this more fun for people. And in so doing, making it, make it more fun for myself. And didn't you love a teacher who was funny? Didn't you love a teacher who brought that kind of attitude into the classroom? So what can you do in your circumstance that just makes it better, whether that's pulling music into it or putting art on your walls that you like or smiling, you know, it's, it's very subtle at times, whatever it is you can do to make the heaven of the hell you're in. But if nothing else, if you take nothing else from all of these podcasts that I've done, maybe you just take these little isms, <laughs> these little things that I remind of myself all the time. Stand in there. What's the truth? Here we are. Let us make a heaven of hell. You know, I am learning as I go how to incorporate all these things as a response to circumstance that is much more progressive much more uplifting, much more optimistic, much more positive than what it might otherwise be. And it's important in your hell to dedicate yourself to some purposeful action. <laughs> 
Satan decided his purposeful action would be to get revenge. And so I'm going into God's world, into God's earth, and I'm going to corrupt his people. I'm going to have my vengeance by destroying what he has made. Okay, that's his choice. That's what Lucifer decided to do. All right, that makes for good drama. In your case, maybe you're setting yourself to getting out of that job you no longer want. Maybe you're setting yourself to finding a better place to live. Maybe you're setting yourself to kicking that addiction you've got or getting yourself into better shape so as to escape the physical hell that you're in. All right, purpose matters. Having a goal matters. I wrote a book many, many, many years ago where a wise old man said, a man's not happy unless he's working for something. That applies, man was just a loose term said by a man, all right? An old man. Cut me some freaking slack, Jack. Purpose matters. Having a goal matters. Having something you're working towards matters, you know? You can endure, who was it that said it? Nietzsche, somebody? A person who knows his why can endure almost any how. And I think about that a lot of the time as I still try to figure out what the hell my why is, what my how want, I want that to be. All of these things tie into making a heaven of hell. Rather than lying down or indulging in the negative of your circumstance, trying to approach it like, this sucks. But what can we do to make a heaven of it? And I draw that from Milton, and I think of that as I was down on my back in paradise, losing paradise. And... You know, my back is still stiff, but it came back around and I enjoyed the rest of my time there and I'm happy to be back. And part of it was this attitude, I think. Part of it was this approach. Let us make a heaven of hell. And so I give that to you this week, kids. Along with it, I give you the Patreon plug. (laughs) Very quickly, yes, there is a Patreon page for this podcast, kids. It is John. No, it isn't. It is patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast. Set up Patreon because I don't want to run ads here. Again, the, ra- the ads are driving me nuts. So many podcasts, so many channels on YouTube. Ads, 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 ads. Drives me freaking crazy. I was watching TV last night, which I do once in a while. I was watching a few minutes of Naked and Afraid, which is Survivor Man taken to a tawdry extreme. And they cut to commercial and I never made it back to the show. I think they ran like seven or eight commercials in a row. I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm gone. Bye. (laughs) I don't want to do that on my podcast. So I set up a Patreon site, which makes your support voluntary. Okay. It's $5 a month. Think of it as tipping me a buck 25 for every episode. If you listen to this, if you are being inspired, educated, motivated, if you're learning about new music and I've got some coming, if you're just picking up stuff that's useful to your life and you like tuning in and you like hearing a friendly voice in your freaking ear holes, please consider, please consider paying me a buck 25 for the work that I'm putting into this podcast. And it is a substantial amount of work. Okay. $5 a month, patreon.com slash John Huff podcast. I also have merch, john huff.com slash shop. I got samples in of some of my new t-shirt concepts and the raglans actually look really, really good. So those will probably be available in the shop soon. I got mugs. I got shirts. Ultimately, telling your friends is what helps the podcast most. Word of mouth is still the best freaking advertising. Do me a solid. Do me a solid out there in the world, kids. You run across people who could use the sort of stuff I'm talking about, who enjoy podcasts and you think they might enjoy this one. Just do me a little solid and tell them, please. Please just let them know. Share the teasers that I put out. Share the episodes. Just tell folks. Because I've tried to play the social media game, and it's a losing game. And there's weird stuff going on with engagement on social media these days. Seems like a lot of these quote-unquote free platforms are basically shutting the tap off your engagement unless you pay them. (laughs) It's all a business, man. It's all a business. So if you can share my episodes, that would help my teasers. Tell your friends. I have not had a new review in a long dang time, kids. So brownie points and a shout out to anyone who drops me a review on Apple this week or Spotify. Would very much appreciate it. I'm going to stop plugging now. John-Huff.com slash shop. Patreon.com slash John Huff podcast. 
Let's get into some new music real quick. I heard a couple of things that, that I really, really love. <laughs> a couple of things that I really, really love in the past few weeks. I'm always sampling the new music, you know. Most of what I hear doesn't do that much for me, but I've found some stuff that does. The new song by Maggie Rogers called Don't Forget Me. I didn't know Maggie Rogers. She's another one of these people who I hear this song that I've never heard of her before. And I'm like, oh, this girl's great. And then I go scope it out. And she's like playing 50,000 person festivals. And she's got 8 million followers. And it's like, how did I miss this? You know, how did I miss this along the way? Maggie Rogers is an American artist, singer, songwriter. It's been around a while. She's got several records out now. And she released this song called Don't Forget Me. It's the title track from her new album, which is coming out in April. And it's just a beautiful Americana ballad, the sort of thing that I play best <laughs> as a drummer. And I, for whatever reason, I fit into this Americana mold really well. And it's one of these emotive, evocative songs. Maggie Rogers has a really, really nice voice. And it's just a beautiful song. And I really, really liked it. It's dark, of course. It's kind of melancholy kind of love ballad don't forget me but it makes me think of some of the stuff that was happening around probably lilith fair late 90s you know like uh, sean colvin i thought of kathleen edwards those of you who really liked liz stringer who i introduced to this audience a couple years ago same kind of vein as that sarah harmer casey musgraves and this song by maggie rogers but it's interesting because this style is not really typically her. A lot of her previous music was kind of indie pop or pop music. She has a record called Surrender that is very much kind of pop electronic rock, like dark electronic. Made me think some of it of metric, actually. Kind of reminded me of that sort of a vibe. So this song... Don't Forget Me, with its very Americana feel, is much different than a lot of that stuff. So if you've listened to Maggie Rogers before, and it seems to be sort of strange to you that I would be describing her in these terms, that's why. I mean, a lot of this stuff, what I'm hearing now is different from that. But it's freaking great, and I really, really loved it. So check out Maggie Rogers' Don't Forget Me. I will put that, of course, on the John Huff podcast, referenced on the podcast 2024 playlist on Spotify growing and it's very very cool the other thing i heard that perhaps you're not familiar with is this band called night bus one word night bus and they are a band hailing from the northeast of england i think maybe they've centered kind of in manchester or that area and this one you know if maggie rogers was for fans of liz stringer for a connection to this podcast Night Bus is for fans of Slow Dive, okay? There's a distinct shoegaze, a distinct goth edge to this band. It's a guy, girl and two guys, and they released a song called Average Boy last week, which grabbed me right away, because you know, you know, how much I dig this sort of dark goth new wave style with, the, again, the very effectsy guitars, Baseline underneath it, and really, really great vocals. Just really ethereal, subtle vocals by this girl, Olive Reese. And Average Boy, there's a there's an angsty quality to this band, okay? They talk about existential crisis, dysphoria. There's a new word for you, maybe, Katie. Dysphoria, which is a just general sense of unease or dissatisfaction with life or the world come from the northeast of england and those can be rough cities and traditionally you know a lot of music comes out of those places because it's been difficult and challenging and you know if you're a young person today probably the sense of dysphoria this sense of displacement or this sense of just unease with the world or hopelessness. It comes through in your music, especially if your music is bent, if it's angled toward the dark side, as it is with Night Bus. The band is named Night Bus because one of the founders used to work, I think it was like a bartending job somewhere, like a dance club, 
right? And so the idea was they wanted to write this sort of dark, kind of chill, dark music. Suitable, however, for a dance club at the same time. It is not dance music. It is not pop music, but it has that kind of driving rhythm to it. And so he would leave his bartending gig in this chaotic nightclub, and he would get on the bus in the middle of the night to take him home. And it was in those moments on the bus that he would feel this sense of just peace and serenity and quiet you know, having escaped the chaos. And so this is the ethos. This is the philosophy behind the music. It's like This is music for those moments riding the night bus. So it's dark. So it's a little bit gentle, but it's got this edge to it. It's got this dysphoria to it. And it's really affecting. I really, really like it. And this song, Average Boy, is great. And again, it's just kind of trancy. And there are spoken word sections, and then this chorus with this ethereal vocal on it. Average Boy by Night Bus, the soundtrack, they say, to a lonely club night. (laughs) I dig it. It's dark. It's cool. And it fits with a lot of the other stuff I've talked about recently that just has that dark vibe. That dark vibe, effectsy guitars, driving bass line. Really like it. That will also, of course, go on the playlist. And check out the playlist. You know, if you have not listened to some of this music, go listen to it because I'm finding gems everywhere and I'm finding some of my new favorite artists along the way. And I hope you are too. This thing, this particular episode, is longer than I wanted it to be, as they all seem to turn out. I'm going to go now. I am happy to be back in Canada. Spring is springing. I saw a freaking robin on the weekend. First weekend of March, and I saw a freaking Robin. Huh. I don't know, man. Some of us are benefiting perhaps a little bit from global warming, and I hope, I hope they don't come back to me in 10 years and say, well, that didn't age well, Jack. Check out some Milton. Try, in whatever circumstance you're in, that feels like hell, try, try, try to make a heaven of it in some of the ways I've talked about it and others, okay? Find that silver lining find things you can hold on to. If nothing else, indulge in your resilience. I'm going to go. Thank you ever so much for listening. Thank you for your feedback. I will shut up, shutting up, except to say good things do happen when you put yourself out there, kids. And I'll check you later. Yeah. What thinks the teacher will look like this year? Swoons. She's a summer's day.